Hello and welcome to the Zoominar today. Uh, today we have uh, two presentations and the speakers are Dr. Minku On and uh, Dr. Sarah Lindsay. I'm happy to briefly introduce the first speaker, Dr. Minku On from the University College London. Minku completed bachelor's and master's degrees in chemical and bio biological engineering from Seoul National University, then PhD in chemistry from uh, Cambridge. His PhD thesis research in the Dobson lab was an understanding the unfolding and the aggregation of human lysosome, lysozyme. After graduation as a postdoc fellow in the Dobson lab, he worked on the molecular details of protein misfolding and aggregation in Alzheimer's disease. Um, he is currently a research fellow and investigating on the rational design and engineering of 70S ribosome um, and co translational co-translational protein folding under, under guidance of um, uh, Dr. Uh, John Custodolo and uh, Lisa Canberra at the University College London. So Minku, with that introduction, I would like to welcome you to mm -hmm. make your presentation. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Rams, for the um, for kind introduction and also giving me the, the opportunity to, to talk about our work. Um, I'm very happy to talk about our recent work, which is um, to modulate co-translational protein folding uh, by rationally designing and also engineering the ribosome. Um, as we uh, know, many proteins start to fold on the ribosome and, and uh, it's, it's because of, uh, we can think about two uh, aspects to it. Uh, it's uh, partly because of the average length of pro the proteome is much longer than the exit tunnel. The exit tunnel is about 100 angstrom length uh, in length, and it can accommodate 30 to 40 amino acid residues, whereas uh, average proteome uh, is much longer than that. Uh, for example, E. coli proteome, it has an average length of 316 amino acid residues, of, and uh, eukaryotic proteome is even longer, uh, longer than 400 amino acid residues. Um, another aspect is uh, the imbalance between the folding rate and uh, translation rate. Um, if you uh, think about a folding of um, secondary structure, tertiary structure of proteins, uh, it, it's uh, normally sub-second time scale, a millisecond or a microsecond time scale, whereas translation is much slower than that. Um, if you uh, think about it's a uh, seconds to mi uh, minutes time scale. Uh, if you think about uh, an example, like again, average sized protein in, uh, in E. coli proteome, 300 amino acid residues, it may take from like 10, 15 seconds to even a minute uh, for the whole protein to be synthesized. And so we know, uh, of course, a, pro a proper folding of protein is important. And that's why a pro proper folding on the ribosome is also important. And that's why ribosome orchestrates many different events on the ribosome, for example, uh, recruiting uh, uh, ribosome auxiliary factors such as trigger factor, as you can see in this uh, figure. Uh, and because of that, uh, misfolding of protein is uh, very dangerous, as we all know. I, I, I don't think to this audience I need to talk about uh, misfolding and aggregation of proteins. Um, but this is here I show an example, uh, a study from our group that um, is about a protein called AAT, alpha 1 antitrypsin. It's a protein related to a human disease called alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency. Um, and what happens is that this uh, disease-related variant A A A18, ZAAT, it populates, it forms a certain kind of intermediate state on the ribosome, uh, which is like a molten colloquial. Uh, and this, uh, this structure persists uh, during translation and after translation as well. And later, this misfolded protein uh, self-assembled into uh, polymers. And uh, we think this uh, results in the uh, manifestation of the, uh, of the disease. Um, in our group uh, in UCL, we've been studying uh, co-translational folding uh, using various biophysical, biochemical techniques, uh, mainly NMR. Uh, and if you think about a simple two-state folder uh, of, uh, on the ribosome, uh, as, it, it's, it's, as its chain length is increased, nascent chain will come out of the ribosome uh, and, and it starts to fold certain type of secondary structure here, in this case, beta hairpin and later on uh, beta sheet. Uh, and uh, you, you will see it starts from unfolded state, but later on folded state, and there will be folding midpoint. Um, uh, when we also think about uh, the free energy land, uh, free energy landscape of uh, protein folding on the ribosome, 
uh, it's more complicated than one might think. Uh, and it's partly because of the interactions between the next chain and the ribosome. Uh, as you can see in this uh, schematic figure, we see both unfolded uh, and folded nascent chains interact with the ribosome and uh, hence uh, complicates the folding uh, energy landscape on, uh, on the ribosome. Um, so we have been interested in um, these interactions uh, and these interactions are, are thought to be mediated by, uh, of course, out, uh, outside surface of the ribosome, but also the exitonal itself. So um, I have been particularly interested in uh, the exitonal itself. Well, we, we know that this exitonal is a universal conduit, uh, universal channel for all emerging nascent chains, right? Uh, and also, unlike um, the previous view of people that uh, this uh, exitonal is uh, like a passive conduit, uh, like a Teflon-like surface, um, recently uh, our group and many other groups uh, have shown that this uh, exitonal uh, has a rather active role in modulating uh, not only up upstream translation, but also downstream events such as uh, protofolding and translocation uh, into different uh, types of cell membrane. So we had this kind of question um, that uh, how, how does the unique shape of the exitonal, how does this uh, uh, relatively well conserved ribosomal exitonal influence or modulate co-translation of protofolding? And, and this is the overview, overview of our, uh, uh, the rest of my talk and also our paper, which is recently published. Um, so we wanted to understand um, the, the role of the unique shape of the exitonal uh, on uh, co-translation uh, in uh, uh, modulating co-translation protein folding. Um, and particularly, we focused on these ribosomal proteins around the exitonal. There are four ribosomal proteins, and they have um, this protein loop that actually protrude into the inside the exitonal. They are, so they are like a tentacles. Uh, and we wanted to mo um, um, modify these structures uh, and uh, understand what are the roles of these loops, protein loops, uh, in protein folding. So we designed these variants uh, with this loop length uh, variations. And we, uh, after we engineered uh, these ribosome variants using CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technology. And uh, once we made these cell strains uh, with uh, modified ribosomal variants, uh, uh, we investigated uh, the co-translation folding of a model protein on these ribosomal mutants using an integrative uh, structural biology techniques, including solution NMR, uh, cryo-EM, and uh, molecular dynamic simulations. So first, how we rationally designed these ribosomal mutants, uh, particularly the ribosomal protein loops uh, at, the, at the exitonal. Um, this is the structure of 70th ribosome of E. coli. Uh, you can see a small subunit, large subunit, uh, tRNA and PTC peptidyl transferase center where uh, the nascent polypeptide is synthesized. And uh, a nascent chain will come out uh, of the ribosome through this exit tunnel. And as I said, and, and at this exit tunnel, there are four ribosomal proteins that have, um, and that have this loop uh, that protrude into the tunnel. What they have in common is that um, these uh, protein loops uh, directly interact with in emerging nascent chains. Here I show you uh, the analysis of a context of two different nascent chains, FLM5, which is our model protein, is an immunoglobulin fold. I'll tell you, uh, to speak more about this later. And alpha synuclein, we know, is an IDP, it's not structured. Um, regard, irrespective of the, the nature of the protein, its structure and sequence, what we can see is that um, these uh, nascent chains interact with these uh, four ribosomal protein loops, the exitonal loops inside the exitonal. Not only that, uh, these external protein loops have some interesting features, uh, interesting evolutionary features. For example, if you look at um, this UL4 external loop, uh, eukaryotic ribosomes have longer loop, which constructs the second constriction site inside the exitonal. What about UL3 and UL4? Um, they, uh, E. coli uh, bacterial ribosomes, have longer loops than those uh, in eukaryotic ribosomes. As you can see here, E. coli has a longer UL23 and UL24 loop uh, colored in blue and red compared to the ribosomal proteins uh, in our uh, ribosome, in our, in our cells. Um, 
And when we um, analyze uh, the sequence of uh, other uh, um, sequence of the ribosome proteins in other organisms, we could also see that some uh, other bacteria have even longer uh, exit tunnel loops of UL23 and UL24. And this was quite intriguing and very interesting. So based on these um, uh, interesting features, we were inspired to uh, come up with these ribosome variants uh, designs. So initially, we wanted to make single um, truncation mutants of these uh, protein loops to understand what, what would happen to nascent chain uh, in terms of its folding and uh, dynamics when there is no loops inside the tunnel. Uh, we also made additive mutants um, truncations uh, to understand whether there are any uh, additive impacts of these truncations. Uh, as I said, uh, we also uh, uh, wanted to make uh, longer loops of these proteins uh, because we uh, could see from uh, some bacteria that they had longer loops. So basically, we made uh, we tried to make um, chimeric ribosomal variants by uh, putting their sequence into this ribosome protein, protein loop sequ uh, uh, sequence. Uh, we also uh, designed hybrid mutations, uh, one making one longer and the other one shorter, and and the, uh, the opposite way as well to understand uh, whether there is any uh, synergistic uh, 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 impact of these uh, loop modifications. So now um, we actually, uh, of course, we designed them. We, we wanted to make them. We wanted to uh, engineer the ribosomes. And we did this uh, using CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technology. Um, we used uh, two plasmid system for E. coli, uh, PCAS plasmid that has a Cas9 protein uh, sequence and a P-target F uh, plasmid that has the guide RNA sequence. This guide RNA uh, guides uh, Cas9 protein to the uh, area of a chromosomal DNA uh, where you want to make double-stranded break and also make mutations. Um, I, I can't say all CRISPR-Cas9 worked in our system. Uh, some didn't work, of course, but um, we were able to make all these uh, designs here um, uh, using CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, and here I, I, I am showing you some of the examples of the um, uh, agarose gel from colony PCR. You can see the uh, UL22 loop was uh, truncated. UL23, UL24 protein loops were uh, extended. Uh, and uh, of course, we uh, sequenced them properly after this to make sure that we have the right sequence. Um, the first thing that we did uh, after making these cell strains, uh, generating these cell strains uh, with ribosomal variants, we grew them first to see how they grow. Uh, interestingly, all uh, cell strains with uh, ribosomal variants grew in the same way as the wild type except for the two strains that have UL22 truncation, as you can see in uh, magenta and cyan. Uh, and this is understandable because from previous studies that uh, uh, we, we know that UL22 loop is important for ribosome assembly. So what we, uh, what, 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 what we think is happening here is uh, uh, when we truncate this loop, uh, the ribosome assembly is delayed and that's why we have a longer lag phase of the cell growth of these cell strains. So now um, we designed the ribosome mutants, we made them, we generate them using uh, CRISPR-Cas9. Now what, what we wanted to do, uh, to do is to understand what happens, to see what happens to the nascent chain in terms of its folding on these uh, uh, modified ribosomes. Uh, initially, we used uh, a solution NMR spectroscopy, uh, particularly using fluorine uh, NMR. Um, th this is our model protein that we studied. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's called FLM5. It's a, a fifth domain of uh, tandem repeat protein filament, uh, and it's, it's got uh, immunoglobulin-like fold. And, and what we did was to put this on the ribosome with this linking sequence. You can see there's a second stalling sequence. What it does is to stall the nascent chain on the ribosome so that the nascent chain doesn't get released, released from the ribosome. Um, and also there's um, uh, um, FLN6 linking sequence. Uh, which is the following domain uh, after FLM5, and we vary the length of this domain um, to have uh, translational uh, biological snapshots uh, by making these ribosome nascent chain complexes. So uh, we vary the length from 17 to 67. Uh, we, you can imagine that if we have like uh, the link, link, link length 17 or 21, because uh, the exit uh, a tunnel is about uh, 30 amino acid residues that can be accommodated in the tunnel. So um, you can uh, 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 imagine that the C-terminal part of FLM5 sequence uh, will be still inside the tunnel if the L is 
link length is shorter than 30. So uh, in that case, FLM5 will not fold, it's going to be unfolded. And we've monitored this using various animal techniques and 15 and 13 label samples. Um, and uh, if you increase the length, at a certain point, uh, uh, protein uh, FLM5 sequence will be uh, entirely out of the tunnel. Uh, and when we increase the length further, it will be um, uh, distant enough uh, from the ribosome. So it will be happy to fold. And uh, at longer link length, like 47 and 67, uh, FLM5 will fold into its native form. Um, so um, to now look at the nascent chain on the ribosome, we uh, used fluorine NMR. Recently, uh, my colleague Sami in our group uh, developed a really nice technique to um, use fluorine. Uh, basically, we uh, introduced uh, fluorine moiety here, tri uh, trifluoromethyl uh, phenylalanine group um, uh, into FLM5 sequence. We, uh, we did this uh, by ember suppression. Um, and when we look at uh, the isolated protein, not on the ribosome, but in isolation, FL, wild type FLM5 um, is well folded and it gives rise to a sharp peak, uh, as you can see here. Uh, but when we introduce a point mutation to um, denature the protein and, and FLM5 doesn't fold, and it gives rise to uh, another sharp peak at a different chemical shift. Uh, and then now, after we um, uh, put FLM5 on the ribosome using this linking sequence, uh, we can see these, uh, we can have this spectra. We chose uh, three different lengths, uh, 31, 34, 37, because this is where uh, nascent chain folding uh, transition uh, happens more, uh, uh, most di uh, dynamically. Um, and you can see at when uh, the length is 31, um, the nascent chain FLM5 sequence, it has just come out of uh, the, the, the exit tunnel, it's, but still it's very close to, uh, to the ribosome. So it does, it's predominantly unfolded, although, although there is small folded peak there. If you um, use slightly longer length at 34, if you allow the ribosome to translate three more amino acid residues, uh, now our nascent FLM5 uh, nascent chain is slightly further away from the ex exit from the ribosome. Now it falls more and we can see the greater, uh, uh, stronger uh, folded peak uh, and three more residues. Uh, mm -hmm. And you'll see uh, even more folded state. And now this is the major state. This is great. Uh, and we can see, we can monitor the unfolded state and folded state, two different conformations of nascent chain on the ribosome on the equilibrium. So what we wanted to do uh, afterwards, of course, uh, was to, um, uh, look at the nascent chain on the ribosome variants. And this is what we did. Um, uh, so uh, we see, um, I, I understand this is a busy figure, but um, I will lead you through uh, some important features that I think um, uh, from this data. So first of all, um, when we truncate uh, UR22 loop, uh, you can see that for this state population is almost the same as that on the wild type ribosome. So uh, we can, um, uh, we can see that UL22 loop doesn't, um, more, doesn't have much influence on the folding of nascent chain. And it's understandable because UL22 loop is deep inside the tunnel and quite far away from the nascent chain that falls outside the exit. Uh, if we truncate the other two protein loops, uh, we see noticeably increased folded state populations. Um, if we truncate uh, these two loops at the same time, uh, we see even more increase in the full state population. Um, and then what happens if we uh, extend those loops? Uh, we see uh, interesting results as well. Um, when we uh, um, extend UL23 loop, we see more folding of nascent chain, whereas when we extend UL24 loop, there's reduced folding of nascent chain. Um, so uh, from from the NMR, fluorine NMR, we were able to get uh, we were able to quantify the fully state on fully state populations on the equilibrium, which is great. And of course, based on those populations uh, populations, we are able to calculate the free energy of folding on these modified ribosomes. There are two important features here, uh, I think, and one is that um, we see a consistent uh, modulation impact of these modified loops. Uh, on the on the free energy folding, you can see, for example, these truncated uh, ribosomes uh, reduced free energy of folding, and it does the, they do the same at slightly longer linker length uh, in the same pattern with the same pattern, uh, and these ones do the same as well. Um, and another thing is that um, the modulation uh, effect 
is greater at shorter linker length at 31 than at 34. Uh, yeah, uh, note that these uh, scales are uh, not exactly the same. We can see uh, the greater changes in free energy falling at shorter length. And this is uh, on, uh, this makes sense because if you think about the, the distance between the nascent chain and these modified loops, uh, the nascent um, um, the distance is shorter uh, when the link length is shorter. So uh, the nascent chain will, uh, influ will experience uh, almost uh, stronger uh, modulation impact of these modified loops. Um, now we have a really nice folding outcome. We have quantitative data, free energy of folding uh, on these modified ribosomes. Now we wanted to understand the molecular basis of this folding outcome. And we, uh, of course, use other animal techniques, uh, solution animal techniques, but at the same time, we, uh, we use cryo-EM and all auto molecular dynamic simulations. Um, when we look at this double truncated mut uh, mutant ribosome, uh, in our cryo em structure, you can clearly see that these two loops are truncated and there is uh, increased space for the nascent chain uh, to sample inside the tunnel. When we do all our molecular dynamic simulations, um, on the wild type ribosome, you can see the nascent chain uh, ensemble is kind of pushed away to the opposite direction of these loops. Uh, whereas on the double truncated ribosome, these loops are shortened and there's much more space. Uh, so nascent chain has uh, can sample more, uh, more uh, uh, evenly around the exit tunnel and also inside the, uh, inside the tunnel. Um, this is more obvious when we look at uh, this uh, movie. We can see the FLM5, for the FLM5 can sample only uh, left hand side because of the presence of this UF24 loop uh, on the wild type ribosome. Um, but when we look at uh, this double truncated mutant ribosome, this uh, for this state FLM5 can sample evenly around the exit because this loop is truncated and no longer present uh, at the exit. Uh, what we also did was to look at, um, the, uh, to, to um, study the flexibility of nascent chains and also the interaction between nascent chain and the ribosome. Uh, so we used uh, N15 label sample here to look at the intensities um, of uh, these, uh, the, the residues and uh, terminal residues and also we uh, measure the cross-correlated relaxation rates. Uh, we looked at a chemical shift of um, a, a residue uh, that is close to the C terminus. Uh, and particularly from this, so collectively from these data sets, what we uh, saw uh, is that the nascent chain has increased flexibility and also reduced interaction with the ribosome on this double truncated ribosome. Um, and uh, particularly from this uh, chemical shift changes, we were able to quantify uh, the degree of binding of nascent chain and the ribosome on these modified ribosomes. And uh, of course, we can calculate free energy of, uh, free energy of binding on these modified ribosomes. Uh, what's really interesting is that um, when we compare this um, modified free energy of binding uh, with modified free energy of folding that, uh, that, we, uh, that we acquired from, uh, that we obtained from uh, fluorine and amyl, um, we see a good correlation between these two energy changes. This means that um, the, uh, the folding outcome that we see on these modified ribosomes uh, uh, are at least partly uh, because of the, uh, the reduced um, um, interaction between the nascent chain and the ribosomes uh, when we truncate these uh, uh, ribosome protein loops. Uh, when we look at uh, this uh, UR23 loop extended ribosome, uh, you can see a clear, nice uh, and nascent chain density, both inside the tunnel and also outside the exit. Uh, when we look at um, this uh, modified loop uh, more in detail, um, we can see that this in, uh, extended loop, which is colored in gray, interacts not only with helix 6, but also helix 7, unlike the wild type loop, which only interacts with uh, helix 6 here. Um, and uh, from our uh, cryo EM uh, studies and other, other uh, people's study, we uh, have uh, known that um, there is a, like a bifurcation point of nascent chain around this loop inside the exit tunnel. So what it means is um, it, nascent chain can take two different pathways after this point. This, uh, it can go towards left-hand side, towards it, to a helix 24 or helix 50, uh, or it can go to the right-hand side towards helix 6 or helix 7. Uh, when this loop is extended, 
because it interacts both with helix six and helix seven of the ribosome, ribosome RNA. It blocks this pathway towards helix and helix seven, uh, and nascent chain can predominantly go to the other pathway towards helix 24 and then helix 50. Uh, also, when we, uh, we did a similar analysis and uh, looking at the binding of the nascent chain on this ribosome, uh, and when we did so, we were able to again see the um, uh, see a good correlation between the uh, reduced free energy of binding uh, on this ribosome and the free, free energy of folding. Um, so uh, with that, I'd like to conclude. Um, uh, we were able to make, uh, design and make this ribosome variants uh, using CRISPR-Cas9, and we studied the nascent chain folding and dynamics on these ribosome mutants. Uh, what we saw is the UL22 loop, which is deeper inside the tunnel, doesn't seem to have, uh, uh, have a noticeable influence on the folding of nascent chain outside the exit. Uh, in contrast, UL23 and UL24, uh, which are close to uh, or at the exit tunnel, um, they have um, a stronger uh, influence on uh, the folding of the nascent chain. Um, UL23 uh, seems to alter the trajectory, the pathway of the nascent chain inside the, the tunnel, uh, while UL24 loop uh, by being present at the exit, uh, either stabilizes or destabilizes uh, the folded state nascent chain because it can physically make contacts with this um, with the folded nascent chain uh, here at the vestibule. And I, I, I hope that I was able to convince you that um, uh, we uh, by modifying um, the ribosomal exit tunnel geometry, uh, we were able to um, uh, change the folding outcome of the uh, of a nascent chain without changing uh, its genetic code. With that, uh, I'd like to thank my boss, John and Lisa, and also my colleagues, Tomek and Alki, uh, and all other colleagues uh, in our group, and also our collaborators in, uh, in Germany, and also NMI support from Francis Crick Institute. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Minku, for a great talk. Um, liked it very much. So let's wait for a couple of um, a minute or so for questions to pop up in Q and A folder. Um, I have a question to ask. Yes. In the way F nineteen in MR, it looks really simple and nice way to quantify and monitor the folded versus unfolded population. Mm -hmm. So F nineteen gives you the local information because it's a chemical shift, right? So yeah. Uh, can you can you can you, can you, can you uh, give an explanation why the folded one is more shielded than unfolded state? Um, mm, that's that's an interesting point. Uh, so yeah, um, um, I think it's because of um, uh, the structure of the nascent uh, uh, the FLN five native state. So I think um, it's it's because of the uh, close proximity of the of the fluorine moiety uh, to uh, one of the ring um, uh, um, residues. I, I forgot the name of uh, whether, whether it's like a treat fund or, but uh, there is, we, we recently were uh, looking at this with Sammy who developed this technique and uh, we realized that um, actually the, the orient, or actually the orientation of this rescue is important. If it's the opposite direction of, um, of this ring that is in close proximity, we see a, a different uh, type of shielding or de-shielding, basically the opposite way. So uh, I think uh, the reason why we see um, uh, shielding or de-shielding effect in, in the way that we see is uh, perhaps because of the um, uh, a ring uh, residue uh, that is close to this uh, moiety that we uh, at, the, at which we introduced uh, the fluorine residues. Very interesting. Uh, fluorine so, atoms. So you do you do have only unfolded and completely folded states, or you yeah. have something in between, like partially folded state where your CF three moiety or the benzene. Um, group can be not exactly like completely shielded by the ring current effect. Mm -hmm. Do you mm -hmm. have anything like that in between states or you don't see that at all? Um, well, I didn't talk much at all, but um, actually we see uh, additional states. Uh, oh, so there okay. are two different intermediate states uh, that we can even see from, uh, from our one spectra. So there are two broad peaks um, that is published in, in Semis, our, my colleague's paper. Um, and there are two broader peaks, and we, we think that these are two different uh, types of intermediate states. Um, they, they are at, uh, more or less under the same, uh, at the same chemical shift. So uh, similar shielding or de-shielding impact. Um, yeah. Very interesting. 
Yeah. Well, let's take a question from the Q&A folder um, from the algorithm. How can we modify the exit tunnel of the ribosome in vivo? In vivo, um, yeah, that's, that's basically the nature of uh, CRISPR-Cas9. So, um, so we um, express a Cas9 protein uh, in, in E. coli um, uh, with this guide RNA. So um, it's uh, like a, a normal, uh, normal conventional CRISPR technique. So this Cas9 uh, protein will be guided by this guide RNA. Of course, this guide RNA, we will design the guide RNA in a way that we want to guide the Cas9 protein to the chromosomal DNA part that, where we want to make uh, changes, so basically ribos ribosomal protein uh, loop sequence. So, uh, and, and then this Cas9 protein will make double strand break. And then we also provide um, single strand DNA with a sequence that we want uh, um, to introduce basically to the ribosomal protein. Uh, that's, how it, that's how it works. So it looks like there's a follow-up question. Is there a yeah. way the exit tunnel of the ribosome distinguish between the host proteins versus viral bacterial proteins? Ah, uh, um, that's a good question. Um, I have been always wondering about this. Um, and um, I think there is not much, although, you know, CRISPR itself, the system itself came from, uh, uh, is basically uh, from bacterial uh, uh, resistance system, you know, against a viral uh, virus. But um, I think uh, technically there is no um, difference in terms of RNA, so they can't really differentiate. Um, but yeah, um, that's how much as I know. Yeah. Uh, there's another question from uh, Yang Lee. Nice talk. Um, there are two questions. Let me read the first one. In order to construct a complete energy landscape, based on thermodynamics and kinetics, have you tried to examine uh, a kinetic barrier of folding? Um, kinetic barrier for folding. Um, we haven't um, because um, on the ribosome system, I think it's, it's not quite straightforward. Um, so until on, even until recently, we were not able to look at um, the equilibrium folding between two different conformations or rather four different conformations. We are not able to look at um, the equilibrium uh, 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 before, because we uh, hugely depended on um, a different type of labeling schemes, N15, carbon, uh, carbon 13. But uh, since we uh, recently started applying uh, fluorine um, to ribosome nascent chain complexes, we were able to get equilibrium information. So I, I think it's, it's quite, uh, it's kind of a technical challenge to us. It'd be nice to be able to do so, but um, up to now, as, uh, we haven't done it as far as I understand. And the second question from Yang Oli is, uh, do you have a plan to investigate a more complicated system, not just a two-state folding, for instance, a three-state folding? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's, uh, that, that's one of the ways that we want to go. Uh, we, uh, although a filament domain, FLM5, is a two-state folder, a relatively simple protein, but uh, it still uh, you know, populates certain type of intermediate states. Uh, both in isolation, also in the, on the ribosome as well. Uh, Multi-domain proteins, yes, of course, we would love to study other um, structures, other proteins, bigger proteins. So yeah, that's one of the things that, and that's on our list. Uh, let me ask you another question. You talked about the CRISPR-Cas9 variants, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you, see, you did mention about some of those variants did not work. Could mm -hmm. you give some more insights on what did you learn from them? Yes, uh, what I, one of the things that I learned from this was that CRISPR is not easy. Um, and uh, of course, um, so for example, the uh, UL4 protein that I didn't talk much about is another protein that uh, is in the exit tunnel. Uh, but we tried it multiple times to mo modify its loop structure, but none of them worked. So uh, there are some hypotheses or the potential reasons why this doesn't work uh, for certain designs, for certain ribosomal proteins. But um, uh, we don't have like clear cut answer. Uh, we are trying to find out the reasons why, but um, uh, maybe it's because of the uh, certain uh, unknown structure, uh, uh, two dimensional uh, uh, the structure of DNA, uh, like uh, uh, or um, um, uh, ribosome growth defect, or there are multiple factors that we, we can think about, uh, but we haven't come up with uh, one specific answer yet. Thank you very much, uh, Minko, for a great talk. And uh, let's you. go on to the next speaker. Uh, Alexander Bull will introduce uh, Dr. Sarah Lindsay. Alex, all yours. 
Um, yes, can everybody hear me? Wonderful. Uh, yeah, it's uh, actually uh, an enormous uh, honor and pleasure to introduce Sarah as the next speaker, Sarah Linze, even though I very much doubt that uh, within such an audience of amyloid uh, aficionados, uh, Sarah actually doesn't need much introduction. Um, Sarah has spent most of her career at the University of Lund and has really contributed to making this one of the world centers of amyloid uh, research. And um, I think it's fair to say that there was uh, amyloid aggregation kinetics before Sarah and after Sarah, and, uh, and it's really been a transformative work and uh, over the last 10 years. And I have had the, the privilege to you know, follow that quite closely and even be part of some of the studies. So um, the main contribution probably or the main discovery of these 10 years of, of research was the phenomenon of secondary nucleation and the role that it plays in amyloid formation. And I think we're going to hear quite a lot about this a sort of grand uh, overview about the, the, the last year's uh, results. Uh, just uh, just one more thing. I did actually, while I looked this up, I discovered that Sarah has her own Wikipedia article in the meantime. And, you know, I, I think it should be mentioned that in addition to being an outstanding researcher, she writes children's books and is a world champion in orienteering, which uh, <laughs> I wonder how she finds the time to, to, to do that. So um, the stage is yours, Sarah, and we're all very much looking forward to your, uh, to your overview talk about secondary nucleation. Okay, thank you, Alex, for that very kind introduction. And thanks to Rams for the invitation. Uh, and I probably will start with an apology. I'm not the person who often apologizes, <laughs> but um, I will apologize to those of you who were in, I don't know how to get that small. Now you don't see the whole list of people, I hope. Um, I will apologize to those of you who were at Leuven uh, at the protein aggregation conference there. Um, because this talk is very similar <laughs> to the one I gave there a few weeks ago, and I wasn't supposed to do that. So on the introductory slide, um, you see a cryo-EM image, not a structure, an image of amyloid beta-42 fibril. So you see how two filaments wind around each other. And here you see in magnification, it's in principle what you get out of solid state NMR, you get out of structure of one, of the two filaments and the two monomers in each and how they are organized. And, and we see here 10 planes, so 20 monomers in total. And here is what we're going to talk about today, and that is amyloid uh, formation and how it's governed by secondary nucleation. Uh, and I will start by a definition, but it's probably smart so that we all know what we are talking about. So secondary nucleation is very simply defined as the nucleation of monomers in the presence of aggregates of the same type of monomers. It doesn't say anything about where it happens. It's in the presence of those aggregates. Um, and you see this phenomenon in all types of self-assembly processes from crystallization of small molecules. This is a mother crystal you see, be, nave here with a SAM image, and then you see all the little newly nucleated ones on the surface, all standing in the same orientation. If they had formed nucleated in solution and then landed on the crystal, I think there is no probability on Earth that they wouldn't land randomly. Maybe as you see here, this is probably some kind of breakage when you mount the crystal, but the main surface have them all standing in the same orientation. So it's very unlikely that that could happen by chance. You see secondary nucleation in crystallization of proteins. It's a well-known phenomenon and used by crystallographers to multiply crystals. So like this is a crystal of the protein called Rab11b uh, and it looks like a fish. And the scales are probably secondary nucleation events, but you also see this like sometimes even a train of new crystals forming at the surface. Um, you see it in zeolite formation, in the formation of sickle cell hem hemoglobin fibers. So this is like a polymerase, non-covalent polymerization reaction. Uh, and you see it in a range of different amyloid fibrils, including insulin, IUPP, A-beta, alpha-synuclein, tau, probably many more. Uh, and it's a very general phenomenon. You can even see it in, in molecular dynamic simulations of Leonard Jones particles, which are in principle as spheres. So the simplest possible particle can also do secondary nucleation. And it's a phenomenon observed 
at least since 1906, or I would say reported since 1906. And please, if anybody finds an earlier paper on secondary nucleation, please send it to me. So this is the first paper I found uh, by Myers and Isaac in the Journal of Chemical Society Transactions from 1906. Um, and I think the most remarkable sentence in this paper is in the summary. And they say, it may seem remarkable that the facts described in this paper have not been established before. So they found secondary nucleation and found it so sort of self-evident that this must happen that they were very surprised nobody had reported it before. So please let me know if it has been reported before. Um, I will frame this talk around questions. Uh, what are the questions we ask? So I will not describe the discovery of secondary nucleation. I will actually talk about the questions we are asking now that we, yeah, you can never know anything exists, but we have very strong indications that this process exists. We ask a lot of questions about it, and we actually formulated several of those questions in, in a perspective article in the RCS Chemical Communications in 2018. So what do we ask? Uh, we ask, of course, where? Where does it happen? Uh, and how does it happen? What are the molecular events? Uh, is there a templating role of secondary nucleation, like you see in elongation? Uh, is it a specific process? Um, can we learn anything about the molecular determinants of this process? And what are the consequences? Uh, and how can we possibly inhibit this process? I think these are some of the questions we are working on in, in my lab at the moment. And I know many other labs around the globe are studying the same or very similar questions. Um, so let's start with the consequences, because if there are consequences, that gives us more confidence that this is a process worth trying to understand. So if we just start very simple, I think you all have <laughs> at some point maybe recorded these kind of curves where you monitor the fibril concentration as a function of time by some method. Uh, and for such a curve, if we just make calculations for a beta 42 peptide using the weight constants determined in our 2013 paper where we reported secondary nucleation for this peptide and we assume we have a sample of 100 microliters at 5 micromolar. Then it's easy to calculate where does the first primary nucleation event happen and that's very very early it's like as early as I can point on the curve and when you reach the end of the lag phase for such a massive sample millions of primary nucleation events have happened up to the end of the lag phase. It's just that the fibrils that then originate from that, which you can actually detect very early using techniques like cryo-EM uh, or seeding experiments, it takes about to the end of the lag phase before you have like 1% of your sample fibrillar, and that's roughly where your signal to noise is good enough to detect them but they form very early. So the first fibrin typically forms after, I think it's a microsecond or half a microsecond. Uh, and these, mil these millions of primary nuclei, they are strongly outnumbered by the secondary nuclei. Um, so if we plot the weight of secondary nucleation versus this aggregation curve, it looks roughly like this. It starts low because in the beginning there is actually zero weight when there is no fibrils around. But as soon as you have the first fibril, sorry, it starts to take off and then it peaks close to the midpoint because this is a process that is dependent on both monomers and fibrils. And here we have 50% fibrils, 50% monomer roughly. So the maximum weight is often close to that point. Uh, and that means so one consequence is that if you look at those sigmoidal curves, this is not the nucleation phase. This is the nucleation phase. The transition zone is actually also the nucleation phase. Because if you look at the nucleation rate, the green is the secondary nucleation rate and the red is the primary. The primary is highest here, but then it's almost always lowest. It's quite relatively constant and then it goes down. Uh, whereas the secondary nucleation massively out outnumbers it, and the total nucleation rate is very close to the secondary one. And it really peaks very close to the midpoint. So I would say that this is the nucleation phase. Uh, and we can also quantify oligomers using, for example, radio isotopes, um, for which case we would pick samples along the aggregation curve 
spin away fib wheels, take the supernatant on the size exclusion column, collect everything that eludes between void and monomer, and then count, way to count. And then we can actually get the quantification of the oligomer concentration as a function of time. And, and it peaks very close to the midpoint, but it interestingly enough disappears much more slowly than it comes. Uh, and fitting to this data is actually, this is a double fit, fitting both the fibril and oligomer curves, which have their different y axis, fibril and oligomer. So this is about 1% only of that at the peak. We can actually come up with a scheme for the oligomer dynamics. So oligomers can form both by primary and secondary nucleation, and they dissociate. They actually do dissociate more rapidly than they convert to fibrils. So most of the oligomers they form, they go back to monomer. And then I guess in during most of the process, they actually go around in this cycle. So you, you have monomers, but the monomers come in here and nucleate on the surface. Uh, another way to look at consequences is to try to find interaction partners for the products. So then we take advantage of knowing what is the nucleation phase. Uh, and we take a protein array and we put it on top of an A-beta-42 solution because we don't want to have sedimenting fib wheels onto the array. We just want the uh, low molecular weight oligomers that don't sediment but would adhere because of interactions on the, on the array. And the cover slip is then at the, at the bottom. And this is in, incubated for 15 minutes with A-beta labeled with Alexa, and A beta unlabeled, which are separately purified by size exclusion. You can't mix them because this one eludes differently than that one. So you do separate monomer prep, mix them one to five, and then incubate the slide for 15 minutes during this green zone. So where you have most of the secondary nucleation events going on, and then it's washed and imaged. And we found one. One, one is actually really one signal, one, and they all duplicate. So the array has 9,900 proteins in duplicate. And we found one hit above the noise. This is probably noise, so those are not real, but this was a hit we checked on the coordinates. And this happened to be glycogen synthase kinase free alpha, which has a very close homologue called beta, which also has the name tau protein kinase one. So this is cool. So A-beta oligomers seem to interact with a kinase that phosphorylates tau. Uh, we then try to validate this finding from the way using thermophoresis. Uh, and these curves are actually the same reaction but in the same capillaries, in the same instrument, just monitored as a function of time. So we can see starting from pure A-beta monomer and pure kinase, we can see how the interaction actually develops over time. And the time scale here now is, of course, very different from the fibril formation because we have low concentration of A beta here. Uh, and we also have in the capillaries. So it, everything is different, but we really see that the interaction develops as oligomers form in the solution. So now we at least know there are some consequences. So then it may be worth going on asking other questions. Uh, and one question, of course, is what are the molecular determinants? Can we say that, oh, it's due to electrostatics, it's due to hydrophobics, it's thunderbolts, it's hydrogen bonding, it's all entropy, or whatever, what, what is it? Um, and the first way to get towards driving forces and barriers may be to study the process as a function of temperature. Uh, so we did concentration-dependent aggregation kinetics, at seven different temperatures, because we had four plate readers at the time, and we took four temperatures, and then we took another four, but to make sure that the whole set was consistent, one temperature was in both, uh, both plate reader sets, so that gave us seven different temperatures. And from fitting all the data, we could tease out the energy barriers for primary nucleation, which is pretty high, uh, which goes well in line with its um, slope, it's a low rate, sorry, this is a slow process at the low rate. Elongation has a much lower barrier. So once you have formed a fibril, to grow the fibril is much easier than to nucleate a new one. But secondary nucleation also has a much lower barrier than primary nucleation, which is nice. Um, so that, it gives us some hints. And so of course you say, this is evident, it, this is self-evident, but it's still nice to measure things and find, find results that go in hand in hand with the pictures you have in your head that if you put the product, which is here, 
on the same free energy level. So this is just a catalyst. This it doesn't contribute to the difference. The, the net difference must be the same. And that means the barriers must be different for this process to be faster. So for secondary nucleation to be faster than primary nucleation. Uh, and when it comes to the molecular determinants, I will just simply summarize what we have found. So this is again the, the 10 planes from the solid state NMR. And of course, they are a little bit more twisted relative to one another here. They're just lined up. But what you see on the surface, you see this charged. This is uh, ASP23 and E22 here. So this is a very negative strip. Uh, you also have polar regions where you have mainly hydrophilic side chains exposed, but then you have these hydrophobic strips, two of them. Uh, valium 18, alanine 21 are here. And here you have valium 40 and alanine. This is valium 40 and alanine. 42 exposed. We have in principle two strips that run along each filament. So we have two times two on each filament. So then on a fibril, you could imagine maybe not all of those strips are exposed, but there is quite a lot of hydrophobic surfaces. So you may guess, oh, what's maybe the, maybe it's the hydrophobic ones. Um, but what we have found actually is that we can say. Yes, short regions are important, and they are actually important in slowing down secondary nucleation. So you can increase the rate of secondary nucleation by either mutating those, as you see in familial mutants, that exactly these two residues, they go to less negative charge, and then aggregation is faster. And then that will, of course, be a change both in the monomer and in the fibril. Another thing you can do is to add salt. So in this study, we study the familial mutants, here we added salt, and then you also screen the interaction between monomers and between monomers and fibrils, and that also speeds up secondary nucleation. Um, here are question marks, because we haven't been able to kill secondary nucleation or change its rate by mutating the hydrophobic residues or the polar residues. Uh, actually, those studies led to other discoveries, um, which I will come to later. Uh, another question that we ask is where? And the simplest way to ask is it at the ends or at the sides of the fibrils? Uh, and we have very nice cryo EM images taken during a reaction. At the end, the fibrils look normal, uh, but during the process, we can see these cluttered fibrils that have lots of appendices on them. So we call this image secondary nucleation caught in the act. Uh, and the numbers may point to a series of events like different time points, but we don't know. This is just a still image. It's not a movie. Um, we have also done recently D-storm imaging, having monomers and fibrils in two separate colors. Uh, and if we do imaging relatively early during the reaction, we start to see monomers along the fibrils. And if we wait longer, we can see this sort of growth of new structures along the fibrils, and at the end, they are fully detached. So this also speaks for the process happening actually along the fibrils and not at the ends. Uh, and this is just the time course of the sort of evolution of, of stuff on the fibrils. Uh, we also have inhibitors that block either secondary nucleation or elongation. Uh, and if you block elongation so that the things don't grow, uh, it's hard to believe that that happens on any other place than the ends. So that leaves then the sides uh, for uh, the secondary nucleation inhibitors that they probably bind there. And we also see that in cryo when we have gold, uh, add gold uh, label antibodies to the inhibitors that they are actually along the sides. Um, but you can ask this question in slightly more detail where. Um, so if you believe it's along the sides, you can still wonder, is it discrete sites or is it diffuse sites? Uh, so the diffuse sites would happen at 4.7 Armstrong repetition, which is the spacing between the layers in the beta sheet. Uh, discrete sites could be at, for example, defects, if there are defects in the fibril um, of different sorts, and, and defects could be like uh, trans dislocations or translocations, branching, missing monomers. You, yeah, 
we, we don't know, but um, it's hard to believe that the football is perfect from the beginning. There must be lots, a lot of defects during the formation process, and maybe there is where it happens. We actually have a paper where we studied the stoichiometry of the binding of a secondary nucleation inhibitor to fibrils, and the stoichiometry seems to be very low. So that speaks in favor actually of binding to some kind of defects on the fibrils. And this one is there just to remind myself to think outside the box. Um, maybe it's inside. We always think of the surface outside, but maybe it's in, maybe it's between the filaments. We don't know. So we should keep that in mind, not, not be too limited in our thinking. Um, next, may, we may wonder if the process is specific. Uh, and this is indeed a really ill-posed question. I think I started my talk by saying that secondary nucleation is defined as the nucleation of monomers in the presence of aggregates formed from the same type of monomers. So it means that like these, these two, as you saw, they disappeared. This is secondary nucleation. This is secondary nucleation of something else. But what occurs here cannot be secondary nucleation. So we can say we study the specificity of surface nucleation. That is still fair. So then we can put them back and we put the question mark here. We, we can ask in what, you know, under what condition or for what cases do we see cross seeding on the surface? Uh, so one study we did recently was to study the role of chirality. So we bought synthetic peptides of A, beta 20 to 34, so relatively short peptides. And then you can, of course, the chemical synthesis, we still have errors, but I mean, the error frequency goes to the exponent of the sequence length. So it's uh, much less errors when you have 15 compared to 42. So we bought them as all L or all D uh, peptides, still knowing that there may be racemates in them. Uh, so we should always use them or treat them with a grain of salt. Um, but we asked the question, do these two peptides, they will form identical fibrils but mirror images of one another. Will they cross seed each other? So we did the experiment. And here is the result. To the left, we see all the cross seeding experiments are at the baseline for up to a week. This is the first 150 hours. All the self seeding experiments have formed fibrils within 70 hours. So self seeding is very potent for both L alone and D alone, but cross seeding in either direction. Some empty ones here are also non-seeded. It's very ineffective. And here we see unseeded, self-seeded, cross-seeded, unseeded, self-seeded, cross-seeded. And the blue is for the L-peptide and the red is for the D-peptide. And I think this data speaks for itself. This is super specific, uh, this surface nucleation when it comes to chirality. So it's not just some kind of non unstructured random surface association. This is highly specific. You can't, you can't do this process on, on a fibrillum of opposite chirality. Um, so this, these quadrants are gone uh, in, in this case. Um, I will also make a list now for you of all the cases, not all the cases, some of the cases we have studied, because we have studied cross seeding now for a huge number of different cases. Uh, and in some cases we have found full compatibility so that self and cross seeding seems equally effective. And in some cases we have found that they're fully non-compatible. So on the non-compatible side, we have this chiral, chirality. Uh, we do have uh, A beta 42 versus A beta 40. We don't see any cross seeding of those. When we start from recombinant peptide of each meaning sequence, pure. Here it's a little bit more tricky if you start to use synthetic peptides because then I think the sequence failures here, which will be 35%, I think you will have something like 41 different A beta 41 and 1700 different A beta 40s in this one. Uh, that will change the picture. But if they're sequence homogeneous, you don't see any cross seeding between these two. We don't see any cross seeding between. A beta 42 wild type and a mutant that looks very benign, serine 26Q. 
So it's just a polar residue substituted by another polar residue somewhere in the middle. And we have another case where we substituted one of the hydrophobic residues. There was no cross-seeding. Uh, on the compatible side, we have a lot of examples. So A beta 40, if you continue to truncate to 37 or 38 residues, they are fully compatible. If you take A beta 42 and instead mess with the end terminus, you can extend it up to 40 residues. That's full cross-seeding, absolutely equally effective. Um, and you can do three other hydrophobic mutations and it's fully compatible. Uh, and you can do a lot of mutations at the end terminus and it's fully compatible. Uh, I will show you data for the S26Q because it's so striking. Uh, this is wild type seeding itself. So unseeded and an increasing concentration of seed and three replicates of each. Here it's the S26Q mutant. Very similar data, seeding itself efficiently. This is the seed of the mutant and wild type monomer. And Kalyani Sanagawa Rapu, who did this experiment, she did it four times just to make sure she hadn't forgotten the seeds. There was nothing else, she hadn't forgotten the monomer. The monomer is there, you see, but because it aggregates, but it was very clear that there was absolutely no seeding effect. And not even when you go up to 30%, which is like heavy seeding. These seeds are like, it's like they are not there in the solution. Uh, another case that is fully non-compatible, uh, I think we can, yeah, we can start with S26Q first, uh, because we, I think we may be able to explain it by looking at the combined model by NMR and Sachs. So first the NMR model, which is here, and we turn it 90 degrees towards ourselves and look at the fold, bones to the hydrophobic residues are in the core of the fib wheel. We have those two strips and S26 is here. Okay, so what's going on? Um, but then if we look at the model, uh, if we combine NMR and small angle X-ray scattering, we can get the cross section dimensions of the fib wheel. So we can learn how the two filaments are arranged relative to one another and the cross section is a very elongated ellipse by scattering. So the short diameter fits the solid state NMR and the long fits them if they're aligned next to each other the longest possible way. And then we can build a model that's compatible with the SACS data based on the solid state NMR for the core and then modeling the end termini, which are then in two different places because this is a symmetric uh, dimer of filaments. Uh, it's modeled as a symmetric dimer. And then we can see where S26 end adds, ends up. Uh, in two copies, it's relatively exposed. So here is the serine, but in two copies of the monomers, it's actually hidden. Uh, it's inaccessible in, in the contact area between the filaments. So it's probably impossible to fit a glutamine here, which is actually, uh, when you start to think about it, it's not such a small mutation because it is bulkier. You add carb, you add two more heavy atoms, maybe even three because it's another carbon and, and, and it's uh, another, it's oxygen, it's a nitrogen, and there's another carbon as well. So it's actually four heavy. So it's quite a lot bulkier and it, it doesn't fit here. It's, there is no space for it. So in the essence is that the, the mutant S26Q cannot fold in this manner. It has to take a different fold. And that is the same result we see when we look at the um, hydrophobic residues. If we mutate those, um, we don't seem to uh, be able to nucleate, and I will go all the way to the data for the hydrophobic mutants. So some of them were fully compatible. So these two and alanine 21, if they were mutated to serine, it was fully compatible. But if we mutate valine 18, uh, we couldn't cross seed. Um, and this is an example here of the complete failure of cross seeding. Uh, and we believe uh, the explanation is again that we form a different structure because if we look at the cryo-EM images, the 
mutants that don't cross it with wild type have a very long twist distance. This is wild type, it has a very short twist distance, so the node to node distance. So they are evidently folded in a different way in, in these mutants. And we can even group the mutants in this study into those that had a large pitch and a short pitch. And here is A beta 40. So those up here cannot cross seed with wild type. And all of those down here that had similar structure could cross seed with the wild type. Um, so there may be a template in role uh, of secondary nucleation. And I think my time may be gone now. How, how are we, Alex? Um, yeah, uh, if you have a couple more minutes, I'm sure it's fine, but... Okay, a couple of more minutes, then I will just quickly go for inhibition. We have shown before that you can inhibit secondary nucleation by binding to the fibrils. Uh, so I will just very quickly say that we now have new data that we can also inhibit it uh, by searching for inhibitors that actually bind to the oligomers that seem to hinder their conversion to fibrils. And an example came from phase display where we did, we made our own little phase display library and we searched for binders of monomers and fibrils. Uh, and we did next generation sequencing and we chose a sequence that had many cousins in the selection and also happened to be very similar to one that was rationally designed against the structure of A beta. Uh, and that one from our library, we, we, we then expressed free from phages and, and purified. These are very easy to purify because you start by boiling and then just three steps, ion exchange in EDTA and then in calcium and then size exclusion. It's then hyper pure and you get about a gram per liter. So these are nice to work with. Uh, and this is the kinetic data. So we have very clear indication here of inhibition of secondary nucleation. Uh, and we also have binding data by SPR, by FRET, and by MDS that all together tell us uh, that this inhibitor binds to the oligomers, uh, not the natural fibrils. So you see an interaction that go comes and goes over time. Yeah, this is very ugly <laughs> data, but it's still, it comes and goes uh, in a similar manner as the, as the oligomers. So with that, I will stop and I will show the acknowledgements so that you don't believe that I have done all of this myself. A lot of people have been involved from many places, not only Lund, but of course, a lot of individuals at Cambridge, Dublin, Boston, and Harvard. Yeah, Harvard is also in Boston, MIT. Well uh, I guess you're the only PI I know that can actually claim that she's done a lot of that herself, but <laughs> uh, fantastic, Sarah. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, do we have any questions in the QA? I do not. I should, I do that. I should, ah. I should somehow open the chat. Yeah, there it is. I can open it. Uh, okay, so now there is a massive question. Um, uh, in fact, five questions it appears so I, I think i'll just start um how can you explain influences of lateral association deformation and remodeling of amyloid fibrils on secondary nucleation and can you analyze those data using your regimes mm -hmm. so if i understood there were lateral association and there was deformation and remodeling. I'm not sure what that refers to exactly. No, but if we start with lateral association, I guess it is fibrils. You often see in cryo that you get bundles of fibrils. Um, I would guess that you then get less surface area. But I mean, the question is very important and very relevant. So I guess you probably get more and more bundling over time and that you can follow by cryo EM. And then of course, one couldn't pick samples along the plateau and see if the seeding capacity changes. So I think that can be studied. We have just done a little bit, but I think I don't have any conclusive <laughs> result yet, but I think that is possible to do. Uh, deformations, um, I'm not sure what that would be. I mean, the, maybe that relates to the thing I said that there could be defects and that would be the same. Defects would heal over time and would reduce the seeding capacity. Bundling would increase over time and decrease the seeding capacity. So it may be so that these are factors that go in the same direction and therefore it would be difficult to separate them. Um, um, okay, uh, yeah, the, the number two of the question list uh, was, 
that it, it appears that there are oligomers left at the end. And uh, the question is whether it, you think it's, it should be described as a three-state system with not only monomer and fibrils in equilibrium at the end, but also some oligomers left. Mm -hmm. Yep, there are some. So if you look at this one, I mean, this is the aggregation kinetics. <laughs> Very ugly again, because one is by time flame T and one is by turbidity. And the oligomers peak close to the transition midpoint, and then they disappear slowly. But we have to remember this is 1% roughly. So the maximum, the peak is about 1% of the total monomers. So what you have down here is, is much less than a percent and is even less than a promise. So if you, if you start with five micromolar, you would maybe have a nonmolar or less here. Um, so again, was the question, was it about equilibrium or was it about the... Uh, yes, uh, I mean, consider it says considering a critical monomer concentration for exactly. amyloid formation. Yeah. yeah, and then one often studies what was left at the equilibrium mm -hmm. as a function of initial concentration. I think the contribution for oligomers in most cases, but one can never say never, uh, will be minor. But of course, it's an error when you quantify the monomer if there's oligomer also, but the oligomer will still be in the phase. So if you look at this as a phase transition, you will have the solid phase, which is the fibril, and the solution phase that will be mainly monomeric, but there may be some oligomeric species in there as well. Uh, great, uh, so next, next part, uh, cross-seeding. The question is whether cross-seeding can also be analyzed or explained based on secondary nucleation. And, and I guess you did uh, distinguish between those systems where you can Exactly, where you, where you can account. and where you can't, yes. yes. So we, we believe that when it happens, uh, it is, so the cross-seeding, as I said, by definition, this is maybe not the best image we should have, the one where we had the... Do, 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 do. This one. So if you have cross-seeding, it doesn't mean that you have secondary nucleation, but you have surface catalysis. Um, so when it doesn't exist, it means like for those cases, it doesn't, and, and, and I think the question can be, as wide as you like it, because there is a paradox here. And that is that, for example, A beta 42, wild type, you can catalyze its nucleation by foreign surfaces, polystyrene nanoparticles, mm -hmm. maybe even fibrils of another protein. Something that is different enough seems to work. So that is like a general surface catalysis, which I think you can understand if you accumulate surface active A beta close enough on the surface to increase the local concentration uh, and of course also if you nucleate on a surface you have you have actually less surface energy because you have one one mm -hmm. surface is kind of hidden on the foreign object so the interesting thing is that it cannot happen in cases where the system is frustrated so it seems like if it's a similar object so if the fibril is formed of something similar a peptide with just a point mutation or a little length difference, then probably the monomers, they try to nucleate, but they cannot copy that structure. For steric reasons, probably there will be clashes, for, for, like for the S26Q case. So that structure can probably not be formed by the wild type and vice versa. And then the peptide can almost make it, but they cannot fully make it. And then maybe you actually, yeah. Um, Actually, uh, can I maybe add another, uh, mm -hmm. like, uh, another aspect myself, which is from your experience, do you think that cross elongation is more or less sensitive on sequence changes than cross secondary nucleation or cross nucleation? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. I think cross elongation is much more tolerant <laughs> because okay. of the lower energy barrier. So I think you can, maybe you cannot cross elongate if you cannot form the same. So like here where we saw even a 30% you saw nothing. Um, but I think that fact comes to the, like if you have A beta 42 wild type, but the fibrils are formed in a different solution condition, like the experiments we did together with alpha senegas. If you bring fibrils from one solution condition to another one, you may be able to elongate that morph, even if it's not the most stable one, mm -hmm. uh, because the barrier for elongation is much lower than the barrier for even for surface nucleation. So you actually more quickly grow. Uh, so in principle, you beat thermodynamics by seeding. Uh, and that's what a lot of scientists have success, successfully done, taking brain-derived seeds 
and bring them to a pure buffer condition where maybe another morph is the more stable one, but still you can propagate the morph on the brain. And we have also succeeded doing that through elongation. And then we do like 50% seeding all the time. So you take the same amount of seed in monomer. And then when you're done, you add it again twice the monomer and then four times. It's like a checker game. You just keep on adding twice as much monomer in each step. Mm -hmm. So I think you can actually, yeah, you can, oh, the elongation barrier is so much lower that you can actually do that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, such that we don't monopolize this uh, completely with this uh, one question, uh, maybe I'll skip one question and go to the last one simply, uh, which is because there's so many others in the queue. Um, mm -hmm. The question about polymorphism in a given sample, uh, the fact that you see many different species of fibrils is that, and that's not really captured in the theoretical analysis, is that something that uh, is, is a problem or like uh, basically it asks you to comment on that? I think it's, if you think about the kinetic analysis by equations, it's in principle not a problem because there is no structure in there. It's just weight, weight columns and barriers. Um, and it may be so that you have some initial polymorphism, but in principle, if you have a constant solution condition and, and a pure sample and one sequence, it should, of course, at time equi time infinity, it should be one morph. It should be the most stable one. But it may be so that you have a couple of them that are very of similar stability. Mm -hmm. So we actually have data on that, like on alpha synuclein. It, it may the same solution may take one or, or another morph. Um, mm -hmm. But in principle, one could treat the, the, one could expand the equations and assume that you have different weight constants for different morphs, especially the secondary nucleation and elongation weight constant may be different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess that would increase the complexity quite a bit. It would increase the complexity and you would probably end up in this overfitting problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because as soon as you add one more parameter, you always fit your data better. Uh, next, uh, next question is, uh, can you explain why you do not trust data from synthetic peptide? Aren't the peptides confirmed by LCMS? Um, yeah, they are, but you don't see racemates. Uh, so, and and also what you see by MS, you don't. The problem is that if you have, if you take, let's say you have ninety nine percent fidelity in, in synthesis, so that at each coupling step it's ninety nine percent correct, and one percent wrong, or one percent miscoupling, and then you take zero point ninety nine and raise it to forty two, you get zero point sixty five. So you have sixty five percent correct, thirty five percent something else. The problem with that something else is that it can be 41 different A beta 41, and it can be 1700 different A beta 40, mm. and the racemates in addition can be anywhere. So it's not an easy problem because it may be that you have just a, a very, very low background. Because mm. it's, not, it's probably not so that any one of those is favored. So you probably just have a, a, a huge collection of other things. Um, yes. Mm? Um, so that was from an anonymous attendee, but now it's Astrid Grasnund. Uh, she asks, what about electrostatic interactions? And I'm not, not sure what specifically that refers to. It, it maybe she, she could uh, precise, uh, be a bit more precise about that. But I guess you did talk about the role of electrostatics in some aspects, uh, given yeah. the charge mutations that you made. Exactly. Yeah. So what we know is that these charged residues, for example, uh, 22 and 23, that are both negative, that they they in principle hinder secondary nucleation. It's not so that it doesn't happen in the wild type, but if they are mutated, uh, secondary nucleation rate goes up quite a lot. It goes up so much that it actually saturates so that the detachment becomes the rate limiting step. Um, so that we know with electrostatic interaction so that they, they counteract secondary nucleation because you have repulsion. You have a net repulsion if you have a net charge on the peptide. But if the pepper is uncharged, I guess then there should be no such net repulsion. Um, now it's David Eisenberg who asks whether your peptide while a TIRLM adds to the oligomers or breaks them down. Or breaks them That's up. a very good question. Uh, we believe it adds to the oligomers, but one can always believe. And that is because of the SPR data um, which I've skipped very quickly. So here, the 
uh, we call it the SNK molecular ultrium. It's a fantastic name. Uh, if we inject it over immobilized fibrils, we see almost no interaction. But if we first inject a beta monomer on the fibril, which is here, and then inject S10 K molecular ultrium, we see interaction. So it seems to add on to oligomers on the fibrils, and then the dissociation is very, very slow. Mm -hmm. um, so it probably doesn't catalyze the breakdown of, of the oligomers. It seems to do the opposite. Mm -hmm. But we don't know. Uh, Nick? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Next uh, question by Ashutosh uh, Tiwari. Uh, very interesting talk. For seeding experiments, did the seeds age uh, change the aggregation kinetics? Mm -hmm. it, I think we have preliminary data saying that there can be an effect of aging. Uh, and I wouldn't say more because we need to do this more again <laughs> in a systematic manner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, ne next one, I mean, we're, we're really keeping, keep getting questions in. I think your, your talk raised an enormous mm -hmm. amount of interest, obviously. Um, Pu Duan is the next, um, ask the next question. Whether the experiments are done with agitation, and I guess most of yours are not done. And, and, but I do remember that you discussed this at some point, maybe not today, but whether or not um, agitation plays on secondary or primary nucleation. That's the question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So that is also not fully resolved, but there is definitely uh, in the, if you read the literature from the 1960s and 70s, which I guess you do every day, uh, there are lots of papers on the role of agitation on secondary nucleation. Uh, and this is used uh, in industrial crystallizers. They always have agitation because industrial crystallizers build on the phenomenon of secondary nucleation to propagate the more if you like, to get a clean homogeneous end crystalline product. Uh, the only time you try to suppress secondary nucleation in the industry is when you make diamonds, because you want few and big and not many and small. But in most cases where you want crystallization, you actually want ma many crystals that are identical. And then all these industrial crystallizers have some kind of propeller. So they use mild agitation to speed up secondary nucleation, probably by facilitating the detachment uh, that at least is the theory in those papers. So to facilitate detachment of the newly nucleated species, if this is the case for amyloid or not, remains to be found. But it seems at least that, I mean, these are data from Emil Axel, and this is from Jing Hu. These are unpublished, but these are data uh, where uh, less agitation and more agitation in this case means low or high frequency of plate reader motion. So it's not really setting the plate reader to shape, but just moving the plate more quickly. Uh, and others have published such data. I think it was for IEPP. It was for another system. So definitely there is a clear effect just by moving mm -hmm. around the plate. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's probably we going are, to be we're... difficult to, yeah. Going mm -hmm. to be difficult to separate that very neatly and cleanly from fragmentation though. Oh yes, but uh, so we are doing that now, and I think one way maybe to look at the scaling exponent because they yes. fragmentation yes. and secondary nucleation have had different scalings. So if we look at how that changes, we are actually on <laughs> working on it at the very moment. So I cannot cannot say yet, and it may also be so that it's different in different systems. It may be so that some systems may be so that you actually speed up fragmentation. In in others, it may be that. So it must depend on the fragility of the fibrils themselves. What is the main effect? So now it's uh, David Eisenberg again with another question. Uh, and I'll, I'll read it word for word. Uh, Sarah, you gave us a clear definition of secondary nucleation in terms of molecular interactions. But the great physicist Percy uh, Bridgman argued for operational definitions to prevent confusion. These define entities and concepts in terms of the operations used to observe them. Why not adopt an operational definition of oligomers? Yep, that's a very good point. And I think there are um, some papers do that. Um, so, I mean, oligomers can be, be defined by their size, their surface properties, their seeding properties, their toxicity, their structure. So, and all of those 
aspects differ from those of fib wills, but an operational de definition uh, in one paper, we, we said, okay, it's everything that lives between the void and the monomer of the size exclusion mm -hmm. column. That's an operational definition. Uh, and I think I have seen that in several other studies as well. Um, so in, depending on what measurement technique you use, you see a subset mm -hmm. of the oligomers. So in that work, we miss all the oligomers that, big, that are big enough to go in the void, for example, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or those that sit on the fibrils. Those we also miss. So as I agree, one, I think one also uh, studying oligomers, one has to be very clear. What is the definition I use? Mm -hmm. Where do they come from and, and, and how, how have I prepared them? Hmm? Yeah, so thank you. There is two more questions and one of them is actually for Minku. That's why I might actually mm -hmm. go with the last one for you first and then mm -hmm. we can maybe come back to, to Minku. So the last one for you, Sarah, is um, it says by Olga Gorski, maybe I missed it, but what's the molecular basis for the detachment of the nuclei from mm -hmm. the parent fibril? That's a fantastic question. I love that question. See, do I have any, uh, yeah. So let's see, I do, I, I know I have, but I don't know if I put them here, probably they are gone. This is about the quasars and <laughs> the kinetic particles. Uh, no, so let's talk about this without images. Uh, we can stop share even. Um, so what do I believe? Um, it could be steroid clashes. So I mean, no, since nobody knows exactly how it happens, it's fine to speculate. So one speculation I have is that you have a fibril of two filaments and during secondary nucleation on the side, the system, the monomers, they try to copy that structure and fold in the same manner, forming a third strand or a third filament. And that is possible for a certain number of turns, but after a, a cer another certain number of turns, it's no longer possible because of steroid clashes and then it detaches. So that's one theory. I think David Eisenberg, who is in the audience, have some data where there is actually published, where there is a third, at least maybe not a whole filament, but there is at least a third strand uh, along the fibril that tries to do something. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so, yeah, I think that that's all for you, Sarah. Now you can breathe. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very you. much for the, for this amazing talk. So we have one more question for Miku, actually. If you're still, yeah, yes, you're, you're still here. Perfect. Um, by uh, Murugesan Velayutam, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. So, is there any chance and probability for a small molecule or peptide to enter at the end of the tunnel of the ribbon? Um, yeah, that's a great question, and then of course, it's certainly yes. I'm not sure about peptides, but small molecules, of course. Um, great examples for that is antibiotics. That's how antibiotics work. Um, small molecules, antibiotics go in, in, uh, into the exit tunnel and interact with the nascent emerging nascent chains, and also ribosome RNA, ribosome protein is, proteins inside the tunnel. So yeah, um, um, so yeah, it's it's certainly possible, and that's how. Uh, we use uh, antibiotics uh, and uh, not sure about the small peptides. Of course, small size can go into the exit tunnel. Um, yeah, it, it depends on the size of the peptides here, um, that we are thinking about. Um, yeah, uh, great. Um, I think it's a good time to, to probably conclude the, the, the talk. Sir, I have a question for you. Great talk. I like it very much. Uh, how stable are the oligomers in your SEC column? Uh, do, do you see how accurate are the quantification that you come up with based on the size exclusion chromatography? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. And of course, there must be losses. There is always losses in every experiment. So uh, so we, we, we don't know exactly what are the losses, but all the time when you do, if you take a monomer of A-beta, so we do multiple rounds of size exclusion before we use it, and each time we lose half. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we lose roughly half, I would guess. But the, the important thing in, in that study were we quantified oligomers, even if they're off by a factor of two, it's not a big deal because they're off by a factor of 3,000 from what you would predict based on the nucleation rate constants. So it still means that most of them dissociate. Yeah, they were not off by, a, if they were off by a factor of two, then I think it would have been very risky to take any conclusion, but they were off by many orders of magnitude. Thank you very much, Sarah, for a great talk. Uh, thank you, Minku, for a very nice talk.
Thanks, Alex. And thanks, everybody. We can conclude the session. Bye-bye.